Christopher Lichty is president and creative director of Meyer and Lichty Incorporated, is recognized for helping companies create a great customer experience and turning that experience into long-term, highly profitable relationships. Also recognized as a branding expert, Lichty consults and executes on global brand strategy. He started several organizations, including Dialect Brand Translation, LLC, which helps companies translate and extend their brands for global and domestic markets. He is also the co-founder and current president of the AIGA Center for Cross-Cultural Design. His clients include Time Warner, Berlitz, Symantec, the World Trade Center Association, the United Nations, and a Fortune, Fi Fortune 100 financial services company. He received a graduate certificate in integrated marketing communications and a BFA in graphic design. He also completed a LDS mission in Taiwan where he became fluent in Mandarin Chinese. Uh, his interests include skiing, jazz, early childhood education, bookmaking, and American Sign Language. He and his wife Haley are the parents of five children. Um, you may know th th there's uh, at least every semester we try to uh, bring in um, different perspectives. It seems like a number of the lectures and events that we have deal with policy, politics, um, and culture. Um, the Kennedy Center has a long history in interest in cross-cultural issues as creators of culture grams. Um, we uh, are very interested in, in publications and print uh, and online media. And uh, the opportunity to have someone who's internationally known and has worked uh, uh, with um, very interesting international clients and done such great work uh, with offices here in Utah County, uh, among other places, is just a great um, boon for us, uh, and we look forward to the message. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Christopher Lichty. I didn't know what time it was when I met you. Oh, what a lovely time it was, how sublime it was too. I didn't know what day it was, life was no prize. I wanted love and here it was, shining out of your eyes, oh eyes. And I know what time it is now. Boom, 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 boom. Ba do ba do 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 do. Da do da do ba do 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 do. Ba do ba do 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 ba do. Ba ba do ba do do. Ba ba do. Boom, ba do 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 do. Ba do ba do 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 ba do. Ba da da do do do. Ba boom ba do 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 ba do ba ba do ba do 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 ba ba do 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 ba do do. So that actually um, has uh, some meaning. We'll, we'll go through that uh, with it as well. First thing I like to do is find out like what is the scope of the people in the audience here? What are your interests and what are you studying? How many of you are students? So the majority of you are students and what are you studying? Political science. Accounting. Accounting. Come on, give me some. Say let's say that again. Physiology. Physiology. So we've got a wide range. So you're here and you're you're here to to listen uh, and to learn about actions speak louder than words and how branding and creating experiences um, can apply. So um, often I'm speaking to groups that are marketing. Um, that's a, one of my big audiences and also to design communities. But I think that this is something that applies to absolutely everything you might do. If you're a scientist and you need to sell your project, you've got to sell your project. You've got to be able to tell your story. Does that make sense? You've got to be able to make that make sense. You've got to get people to believe in you. If you want to do anything big, if you're in political science, if you're, if you're a, a politician, if you have a movement um, that you want to, to make happen, if you want to change the way taxes happen, if you want to change anything about society as a whole, if you want to change democracy and the way that uh, the flow of things is happening, you have to get people on your side, right? You have to get the message out in a big way and you have to get people on your side. And um, as things have progressed from in branding and, and public storytelling, 
uh, more, the more time goes on, the harder it is to get messages out because there's more and more competition and you just have to understand how these things work. So this is a basic uh, kind of primer on, um, uh, on how to do that. But I always like to start with a little bit of personal information. Usually I give these presentations around the world. I gave this uh, lecture in Beijing in November. I gave it at, uh, at Kent State um, last uh, April, last month. Um, you know, so I've, I've given this lecture around the world and normally I have to say why I live in Utah because that's kind of like the big question like, okay, so if you're so, you know, good at this, uh, why do you live in Utah? And I kind of say, okay, Sundance is like 20 minutes from my home. This is my son Carl who helped me to uh, do the Shadow Puppet Show and uh, he's on the Sundance ski team here. He's right, right here. And uh, so my kids are, are, we go up and we ski every Saturday and just a little, you guys know this, this is my backyard. We have an acre and a quarter farm with llamas and uh, rabbits and ducks and other things. So, um, you know, when, when you, just these two slides and everyone says, okay, Utah, non-question non anymore. <laughs> I understand. Uh, it's, the world is flat. You can work from anywhere and I understand why you live in Utah. So, um, more about that. I'm also give a little introduction to my work at the AIGA Center for Cross-Cultural Design. AIGA is the Graphic Design Association in the United States. It's the largest and oldest graphic design association in the world. And um, several years ago when I got involved with them um, uh, through the local chapter here in Salt Lake City, I realized that on a national level there was no international component. And I would go to the national meetings in 1999, 2000, and I would say, you know, international is important because that's kind of what I did and people's eyes would literally glaze over. I mean, you'd be talking to somebody and you'd say, start talking about international issues and they'd be like, oh, I'm so not interested. You know, it was, it was just amazing how not interested people were. And so I was trying to push this and it wasn't really going anywhere. Then September 11th happened and uh, people woke up and realized that uh, there were important things happening outside of our country. And so um, at, after that time, the time was right, the mood was right, so with some friends, around the country we started the AIGA Center for Cross-Cultural Design with the idea of connecting the U.S. design community with design communities around the world, uh, talking about cross-cultural branding issues, developing, doing research, um, and also uh, presenting information about cross-cultural design to the business community. So some of the things that we do, sorry this uh, mouse has to wake up sometimes, um, are this is a, a conference that we organized in Seattle last summer. Uh, with an international design association called ICOGRADA. They have the national design associations from 50 countries. And so it's kind of the United Nations of the design world. And uh, so in partnership uh, with them, my Center for Cross-Cultural Design put on this event. We had 500 people and we brought designers from every part of the world. This gentleman here in the multicolored coat is from Zimbabwe. Uh, he runs a school on graphic design in Zimbabwe. Then we have people from Denmark, we had people from Hong Kong, we had people from uh, the Benetton Colors Fabrica Institute in Italy, um, and uh, we had speakers from literally every continent all over the world together to talk about globalization, graphic design, branding issues, and uh, it was um, really interesting. We had a fair amount of publicity here in the United States, but it was big news around the world. In the international design trade media, we had major partners. They, they gave us hundreds of thousands of dollars of media and uh, support and it was just really, really interesting to them. And so still, I think we're fighting the battle of uh, lack of awareness, lack of interest. You know, it's risen, but it's still not as high as when we put things out, people outside tend to be more interested than the people inside. Um, but uh, we also do a program, we're concerned about peace. Sometimes we, we do things that we go straight out and we go to the hottest spot we can find. The first two things that we did when we started the AIGA Center for Cross-Cultural Design were to create a piece, um, a brochure, our manifesto, which was a listing of what our values were, and we printed it in English and Arabic. Um, it had, on the one side, it was the Arabic cover because they read the other way that we do, and on, our, on the other side was the cover for our side, and they read toward the middle. So the whole thing was printed in English and Arabic, and we sent copies to an ICOGRADA meeting that was being held in Istanbul, um, which had designers from all over the Middle East, including Israel and Iraq and Iran, and this was bef uh, kind of in the early parts of the uh, war, um, but uh, it was well received. I have had so many comments about that brochure, and that, that, was, that brochure had a little statement that this was an expression of, 
of fellowship and friendship from the United States to the Middle East uh, from, from the AIGA Center for Cross-Cultural Design. And uh, another time I met a designer in Qatar uh, when I was there. Were you there? You, went, you were there with me? And so I ran into, I was there with Corey actually, with, um, uh, just blanking on, Doha. yeah, well, with the Doha conference. It was part of the United Nations product, project. And uh, so I ran into a designer there that through that international network and he showed me the brochure. He said, I received this and I was wondering about it. So I designed that, you know. So it was amazing how that kind of came, came around and people were touched by that. The other hot thing that we did is we went straight to Cuba where um, we had to do a lot of homework and figure out how we could do this legally um, so we didn't get in trouble. But uh, we figured out how to do this. Uh, um, we basically partner with the Cuban Design Association and every year, this is our fourth year, we work together with them and we share information online um, and we each design a poster. We select eight designers in the U.S., eight designers in Cuba, and, and then each one shares information and each one designs their own poster about peace. And then those posters have been exhibited in Cuba. Uh, they were on major national t television right next to Fidel Castro things back in 2003 when we first started. Um, and uh, then uh, they've been exhibited all over the United States at the Peace Museum in Chicago and in Miami and in uh, Los Angeles. And so the, tour, the, the poster exhibit uh, tours the United States as we can get funds. It's, we're scraping by always with money, but uh, somehow we get these things done. So um, this is another one. Here's some of the posters that have been created over the past few years. Both by, sometimes it's hard to tell which is uh, by a Cuban designer and which is by an American designer because the Americans tend to use Spanish and the Cubans tend to use English. So here's some of the shots of our people going down and exhibiting in Havana for the kickoff. Icograd is holding a major uh, global, their global congress is being held in Havana in September this year. And so I'm hoping to be able to go and attend that. Um, which is also a nice excuse to go attend a conference that's being held by an organization that's based outside the United States. We can get a visa to go and participate in that. So it's a legal way to go to Cuba. We're also doing an exhibition. Um, I'm going to have to go a little bit more quickly. Exhibition of design from 30 countries. Um, we do publishing. We publish articles on AIGA.org. Um, our website is uh, uh, xcd.aiga.org. And then this is a trade mission to China that I'm leading next April. We'll be taking designers to visit design firms, some of the designers hopefully that are going to be working on the Olympics and see a preview just before it's launched. And uh, we'll be visiting Beijing and Guangzhou and, and uh, uh, Hong Kong, I believe. So now into the main part of my lecture. That's just a little background on some of the activities we've been doing. When we talk about actions speak louder than words and about creating uh, experiences for brands, um, I think it's a time when the standard marketing principles, the, the, the ante keeps getting upped, you know? Originally when you talk about marketing, it was in a rural economy, people would come in into the local store, they'd trade eggs for flour, nothing was really branded because everything was from the local economy. Then when you started getting the industrial age and people started canning things and shipping them, you needed to know where things were coming from so you could know whether you could trust it. So people started putting logos and labels. You know? So with the evolution, of, it keeps progressing up until the point where we're kind of at now, we're at a new shift where marketing today mainly focuses on features and benefits and, and kind of standard advertising. Um, at the advertising industry focuses, their job is to build awareness. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes, but their job is just basically to build awareness. It's not to drive sales. It doesn't take people all the way through. It's just to build awareness about a product. So it's kind of like icon equals awareness equals we're going to increase sales somehow. We don't know how. Um, the other aspect of that is that advertising is basically interruptive. We're trying to get in front of your face. I'm going to get my Coke ad or whatever it is. I'm going to get in front of you wherever you are. And my job is to just like get the most impressions in front of you. Um, that I can. But that basically, we're getting sick of that. I mean, I don't know about you. How many of you are sick of uh, having ads shoved in your face? Um, you know, that's, that's not working anymore because it's, it's, it's just, there's so much competition. It, we're, people are starting to get angry and starting to turn away from advertising. So the idea here is to take it to a new level where people actually want to come to you. You create things and you do things that for people, a certain type of person for a certain type of product, and then you invite them to come and participate with you voluntarily. That's the idea behind experiential marketing. 
So here's my formula, basically, for how experiential marketing works. And I'm going to go through that. Uh, basically, it uh, starts with customer orientation, brand promise, deliver on the experience in the context of a global marketplace. That's marketing to the nth power, marketing taking marketing to a new degree. Um, but, the, but the thing is, um, kind of about my, my title today is that actions speak louder than words. The other thing about traditional marketing or the marketing that's happening today is that, that people say things and they don't follow up. You know what I mean? Your cell phone company says, we care about you as a customer. And then when you call to make a change, do they really care about you? Do you really believe that? How about cable when you call to cancel? You know? <laughs> do they really care about you? Are you a valued customer? Not really. So that's the kind of thing we're trying to get away from. So the first principle here is that the customer needs and the company needs need to be balanced. This is kind of based on Terry Warner's work. That he's a professor here in philosophy, and he has the Arbinster Institute has put out a book called Leadership and Self-Deception. If you wanted to go further in depth about this idea, Terry Warner's work would be a good way to study, study that. Um, in interpersonal relationships, in governmental relationships, in branding, I think it applies here as well. The idea is that are the customer's needs really equal to your own? Or are your needs for profit m higher in your mind than the needs for customers? I think that uh, with a cable company, when you call up and they treat you poorly, and they take you through the runaround, and they, uh, they do every trick they possibly can to keep you on, um, I think then in that kind of a case, your needs are not equal to theirs. They're willing to do whatever it takes to keep you on as a customer, and it's not equal. And so that's the kind of thing that um, I have a hard time conveying to companies. I don't know how really to, to tell this message greater than that. Um, the other thing is about research. And the reason I put this up here is because the, the statistical-based research that was happening at the last days of this campaign um, are really telling. Most marketing companies do research in the traditional survey fashion. They write a survey, they get an audience, they conduct the survey, they analyze, then they wait for a long time. So it might happen between uh, you know, once a year, once every two years, once every three years that they're gathering information in this way. But this kind of research is excellent, but also flawed in that you can only ask what you know to ask. Does that make sense? You can only write a survey, you can only write the questions that you know you need to ask. What about the ones you don't know about? This campaign is an example of that. When it was coming down to the final weeks, they were surveying people about what do you like about Kerry, what do you like about Bush, what are your feelings, what, you know, what, va what values do you have, what do you care about, but the other category started growing into like 30% range. It was like people were saying, I care about, mm, not on my list here, I don't see it here, other, huge. So they weren't asking about the one thing that people were really caring about, and that was about values. They weren't even asking about that, and that was the thing that swayed the election toward Bush at the time. So how should you do research? Basically, marketers are beginning to do research like anthropologists have. Go out, you sit down, talk to people, you observe, you watch, you listen. It's not statistically valid because the, the, uh, the, the groups are often very small, but it's a way to learn what you don't know. Does that make sense? As you're designing and you're creating brands, it's a way to get a rich type of information. It's a way to learn the emotion, to the feeling behind the numbers. And then you go and you do a survey to validate the information that you learned here. Does that make sense? So there's a company called Cheskin based in San Francisco, and they're one of the top companies that um, does research using this methodology. In the, in the business world, it's called ethnography or ethnographic research. So basically, we're going out, we're watching, we're listening. In interface design, when you're doing computer interface design, you only need five people to give you 80% of the information that you would get from any number greater than five. You sit down, you watch them, you find out with five people where they're stuck, where they're not getting where they need to be. With interviews, I understand that you only need to interview 37 people to get the number of uh, the 80 percent of the information that you will get with a greater number of people. Does that make sense? So then you, you do those interviews, you go out, you observe. It doesn't have to be a high cost thing. It can be if you're doing any project and you're trying to understand what your audience, like you're a scientist, you're trying to, to push a new technology. Um, then you want to see how people respond to it. You go out, 
and you test it with people. You go out and you give it a try. You see how it's being received. You can learn about it in that kind of a way. So it doesn't have to be a high cost kind of a method of research. Or you can hire these guys and spend several hundred thousand dollars um, in having them research for you all around the world. Um, this is an example of research that was done on women in China. So they sent someone over there to interview women, to talk to them, to find out what is the condition of women, what is their mindset, how do we market to women in China. And so this woman down here is on a cell phone riding her bike. There's kind of a youth culture thing. There's this culture of cute going on, you know. So there's, there's, these are just a few photographs of that. Um, just a, a little background on ethnographic research. There's this woman named Sarah Little Turnbull. And she, uh, in the 1940s, was the editor of House Beautiful magazine. As part of her job, she would go out and she would visit 300 homes a year. She's responsible for the fact that we have family rooms instead of formal living rooms now. Because she saw this trend kind of emerging, and then she published about it in House Beautiful magazine, and everyone picked up on it, shifted the whole culture of our country um, and the way we designed our houses. She, um, just last year, uh, retired from this lab at uh, Stanford University called the Process of Change Innovation and Design Laboratory and she's been a consultant to CEOs. I went and visited her the last week before she dismantled her lab. Very interesting. Um, JetBlue, I know that David Nealman, is, he, he's out of there now, right? <laughs> but uh, I met him on a flight uh, early on in the JetBlue days. He was taking a flight once a week and he spent the entire flight from New York's JFK to Salt Lake City, starting at the front of the plane, going down the plane, talking to people. It took him the whole three plus four hours talking to people. And when I got a chance to talk to him, he was very nice, listened, very concerned about, you know, he's just talking to people. He told me he took a flight once a week somewhere. And soon after that, he made a change to increase the legroom in between the seats. And the stock took a dip because investors were thinking, hey, we're going to have fewer people on this. This is a dumb decision. But he really knew what, was, what he was doing and was making a good decision for the long term and respect of the customer. Um, other things about customer orientation are the 80-20 rule. And that is that generally, in any business, you can analyze the situation, analyze the, the, uh, the books, and find out that 80% of your profits come from 20% of your customers. In most cases, that happens. The 80-20 rule kind of applies in a lot of ways. So if you can do that kind of analysis and find out who your 20% most valuable customers are, you can change the way you do marketing, and you can understand that. It's kind of like playing cards and having the backs of the cards facing you. You're looking at all these cards, but they all have the same value. Most people do marketing like that. Does that make sense? So basically, you, uh, you're playing with the cards. You don't know how to use the cards because they all have the same value. But if you can turn them over and see what the value is, you can make better decisions. Basically, this is one method of understanding your customers that will help you make better decisions in doing your marketing. So basically, in experiential marketing, understanding your customer, being out listening, this is like the key thing that you need to do. And, uh, and if you have a large organization, it's very difficult to change habits. So now I'm going to switch to the second element, which is uh, brand promise. In the past, we've uh, used mission statements and vision statements that have been very long and detailed. My concept for any type of organization that wants to get a message out um, is to ditch the old type of mission statement and go with a new type of mission statement. Basically, the new type of mission statement is, a, is one promise, one statement that encapsulates your organization entirely. Something that people can remember both inside your organization and out. This is what this diagram is about. It's a brand promise that can be used by your organization so that everyone can align themselves and remember. Otherwise, your mission statement, you put it out there, people file it, and they don't use it again. Except if they have to like refer to it. They come back and they dig it out and say, oh, let's see, um, oh yeah. That's what the mission statement says. But if you have a mission statement that people can like quote off the top of their head, then you can help align people better and get people moving in a direction. You can also get your customers aligned around you and, and they can be clear about what your brand means. So one brand promise that works both internally and externally as the basis of your, uh, your marketing. This also comes back to the action speak louder than words promise that I, that I mentioned in my title, which is if you can align your organization with your marketing, then you can actually do what you say, as opposed to marketing one thing and doing something entirely different, which is what generally happens. 
So brand promise has to be relevant, meaning that it has to be a brand promise that has to do with who you are as a company. It can't be a brand promise that's just some pie in the sky, I don't know how to live this, has nothing to do with who we are and what our products are. So it has to be relevant. It has to be relevant to your customers as well. It also has to be credible, which means that your customers have to be able to give you permission to take that space. Right? If you put out a brand promise and a marketing campaign that nobody will believe, it's worthless because if uh, one of my clients is American Express, for example, if American Express were to put out something that it had nothing to do with financial services, um, then, then that would be kind of outside of their credibility zone. Uh, people would have a hard time giving them permission to do that work. Or if Time Warner, uh, another client, were to try to get into the American Express space, it would be hard for people to accept that. Does that make sense? So um, I know they have uh, Forbes magazine and, and other things that are in the financial area, but still, as a corporation, uh, you know, take, trying to take over a, a different space is something hard. So as an example, um, I'm going to give you a couple examples. Here is a, um, a brand promise from the UVSC School of Business. We've been working with them over the last year and a half to help them to create a mission statement for the School of Business that represents who they are, that people will give them permission to do, and will be something that's credible and relevant to them. So we've come up with this brand promise called Fuel the Entrepreneurial Spirit. So it's not we're all about entrepreneurship. Everybody who comes through our school needs to become an entrepreneur. No, it's about the entrepreneurial spirit. And then so we built these things underneath. What that means, it's about practical and experiential learning. It's about being self-directed. It's about innovation and using fun and creativity in the things that you do. It's about values, uh, social and ethical responsibility, teamwork. It's about big picture thinking, thinking global. It's about leadership. It's about holistic business process thinking. So. Basically, um, I think this is credible for them because they are an institution that can kind of, in terms of like universities, turn on a dime. It's still pretty slow in business world, but in terms of the university world, they really are responsive. They've had programs that deal with multi-level marketing, network marketing. Um, they, they can respond to the community in a way that few institutions can. So there's this entrepreneurial aspect to the way that the whole U Utah Valley University or UVSC um, responds to the, to the world. So entrepreneurial spirit is something that's credible for them in that way. It's also credible in the way that they teach through experiential learning. They're already doing a lot of these things. So um, fuel the entrepreneurial spirit is something that we want the professors to use in the way that they teach their courses. We, they're going to potentially do things like have ropes courses and other kind of experiential learning. They are also already doing um, uh, experiential learning by having real projects come in from the outside so they have their students working on real things you know so there are ways in which they're very entrepreneurial in the way that they go about doing their work um, the next one is uh, this is an industrial manufacturer in the Midwest they make 400,000 different parts of things um, they make the hydraulic units that go into caterpillars they make refrigeration control units all kinds of different things they're, um, they're Brand promise is as the leader in motion and control technologies, that's kind of like the category in which they work, uh, we partner with our customers' success. So basically, uh, the idea is from an internal perspective, their employee mantra is now to be a partner in helping their customers to succeed. Does that make sense? That is the brand promise. And they've kind of combined the vision statement and the brand promise into one in the way that they did it. I've been working. Um, Scott is here from the math department. Uh, we've been doing a little bit of consulting with the Department of Math here and talking about how to create a brand promise and a marketing campaign for math in general and uh, getting people to understand the value of it. And so we came up with the most obvious brand promise you could possibly think of, and that is that uh, math is rewarding, right? So this is an illustration to say that the brand promise is not necessarily your marketing campaign. <laughs> Does that make sense? This is going to be used more, and we're still working on it. It's kind of in the middle, and I hope it's okay to like put this out. <laughs> Hunch of the shoulders, I don't know. <laughs> it's kind of in the mid process. But um, the idea with this is that if we do a, ma a marketing campaign and posters that say math is rewarding, is anyone going to believe that? 
nobody's going to believe it. There have been lots of campaigns that say math is fun. And we're all like, oh yeah, right. You know what I mean? They're doing ethnographic research right now. Yeah, actually they, they are. They, they got to a point where they realized that they needed to learn more about what their student needs were, what their situation was. So we paused the whole program in development to go and do research and to talk to people and listen. So they're actually in that phase right now. Um, but the idea is that if math is rewarding is the message that we want to convey, then how do we best, how do we get people to believe that math is rewarding? It's not that we want to say that math is rewarding, it's that we want people to believe that math is rewarding. So how do you do that? Well, actions speak louder than words, right? So if I can convey the feeling that math is rewarding, people will believe it. If I just come right out and say it, nobody's going to believe it. So I have to figure out, that's where the creative process comes in. I have to figure out now how to get people to, how, how do our actions show that math is rewarding? How does our uh, marketing campaign, a poster, a website, a banner ad, a, whatever it might be, an event, a, a symposium, whatever it might be, how do I show that math is rewarding? How do I get people to have that feeling like, wow, math is rewarding. I want them to come up with it. I don't want to tell it to them. Does that make sense? That becomes the challenge. That's how actions speak louder than words. So here's an example of a company who does this. Um, uh, and their marketing campaigns are not necessarily directly tied to their, uh, to their brand promise. But Aveda is a company. Does anyone know what Aveda's like, core principles are? Do you know? Yeah, natural products. Natural products. Natural okay, very good. Anyone else have thoughts around that? Okay, so does this look like this is all about natural products? If you look at their brand campaigns, this uh, tagline says, the art and science of pure flower and plant essences. They're not coming right out with their brand campaign and saying, we're all about natural products. You know, they do mention it. It's there. It's part of what they do. But it's definitely an action speak louder than words kind of a thing. Their spas and different things. A lot of their campaigns have to do with beauty. They have to do with other things. But if you find an Aveda customer, they know that this is their brand promise. That, that Aveda is a company that's focused on the well-being of people and the planet. Does that make sense? Because their actions speak louder than their words. When they create products, they really spend a lot of energy trying to make the packaging have as little impact on the, on the world as possible. They do research into different things. They have a lipstick case where they injected flax hulls that were a waste product into the case of the lipstick so that there would be less plastic used. So it's a lot of flax, a little bit of plastic. They also, on their lipstick cases, they designed it so that you would have a reusable lipstick case. When you buy a new lipstick, you buy, if you already have some, you buy a new lipstick and it's just an insert. You have the outside packaging, you put the inside thing in and you reuse it. And uh, Aveda is now a subsidiary of Estee Lauder. And Estee Lauder, after they bought Aveda and, and uh, the designers were going through the process of creating this reusable outside package, and putting flax hulls and different things in it, Estee Lauder was saying, wait, 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 this totally goes against every rule that we have ever learned from customers in regard to lipstick. They want shiny, it's got to be like high fashion, it's like nobody's going to want to reuse a lipstick case, it just is not going to work. And so somehow, the VP of design convinced Estee Lauder people to trust them said, we've got customer research, we've listened to our customers, we understand our customers, this is the right thing to do, trust us. Turns out that this was the most successful launch in a product that Estee Lauder had had, and that, that Aveda is 20% more profitable, uh, I think I have my numbers right, if I'm remembering correctly, 20% um, more profitable than any other division within Estee Lauder. It's because of this brand promise, it's because of their social responsibility, it's because they take care of people. In their meetings, the first thing you do is have people stand up, okay, rub shoulders here, rub shoulders there, everyone take some breaths, okay, let's make sure we're all not, stress is kind of out here, now we're going to have our meeting. Does that make sense? They paint their walls with low VOC paints. Every, every uh, salon, uh, they have to verify that the cork flooring comes from a sustainable source, that everything is sustainable as much as they possibly can. They really do live this, and their actions speak louder than their words, and they don't really you know, they don't promote it that much. They do a little, but, it's, but people know it, and it's important to them, and they're willing to pay a premium to participate in a company that has that. So, delivering on an experience. So we've talked about 
understanding customers. We've talked about uh, developing the brand promise and what that means. And then uh, in this section, we're going to have a little bit of stuff that talks about coming directly from a brand promise and other stuff that's a little bit more random about delivering experiences and creating things that people will want to come to voluntarily rather than creating interruptive advertising campaigns. So basically, um, some work we did uh, with American Express, this was just a, uh, uh, a proposal, so it wasn't put into to place, but the idea was to create a points program for American Express that would appeal to investors. So we created this whole points program where you could invest your points. And so you invest your points in stocks, bonds, and they actually the performance of the points mirrors the actual marketplace. And then you could take the points and you can give them to charity. You can take the points and you can give them to your child and let them manage the portfolio. You can take your points out as cash. You have a lot of choices, just like an investor does with, with the investor's money. You have choices with these points in a similar kind of a way. So the idea is to create something that's so in sync with the mindset of the user that it's just delightful to, to participate. It's just so much fun. Why would they go anywhere else? Does that make sense? This one with Neiman Marcus. Um, Neiman Marcus is the first company to ever use a points program in relation to a card. And they've been doing it for uh, 20, 30 years. And um, so we had nothing to contribute to that. But what we had to contribute was how do we promote a, a card that's co-branded with a Neiman Marcus and American Express. The idea was that we would hide things throughout the store. So if you're shopping in Neiman Marcus and you pick up a wallet, you open it up, you think, there's a credit card in here. You take it out, and it's a little promotion for the credit card joint program with American Express and Neiman Marcus. You know, so maybe there's one in the, in the perfume section about the sweet smell of the rewards that you can get. And, and so we use this experience. So it's almost like an Easter egg hunt, and it changes all the time. So every time you come back, you're like wondering where the next thing is going to be hidden. Does that make sense? Little experiential things that, that people talk about, and some card designs that we proposed, and a little bit about the brand. Other things that you can do have to do with technology. So we work with a company in New York called Brand Experience Lab, and, they al and also this uh, other company, Gregory Beck Architects. And so uh, Brand Experience Lab is out there searching for the latest, coolest technologies. So this is another way to create things that are like people haven't ever seen before, so they want to participate, they want to tell their friends about. So it creates word of mouth advertising for you. So some of the examples are that this one up in the upper left hand corner, from your perspective, is, uh, is a ground effects uh, kind of technology where it projects on the ground and then you can interact with it. It reads your shadow and then the image moves based on the shadow. So it might be it might be a flurry of things like leaves, or in one case it was a series of balls that you move your hand over and the balls start bouncing around. And if you push harder, the, the balls bounce harder. Does that make sense? Kind of a cool thing. Um, this one down here for AOL is actually a, a, a three-dimensional surface that is a video monitor. It uses LED lights that can be mounted in a, in a, in a way that uh, on a curve or on a spherical shape it has motion. Does that make sense? Uh, this is the CNN Experience Center, which I just uh, visited last week and noticed that they closed down. So obviously, that particular example was not successful. <laughs> so I, I don't know the details behind that, but I tried to go visit it uh, just two days ago and it wasn't successful. This one over here is a laser speaker that you can put a sound out in a, in a very directed fashion. If you're just off to the side, you can't hear it. So it's something that you might do in a retail setting when you want people to walk by and hear. Um, and this one down here is like enormous 12 foot tall uh, monitors and things like that. Um, another interesting idea is that Illy Coffee Company, uh, they put up a pop-up retail store in Soho, New York. Um, this thing, we were analyzing it from the outside. It went with Greg Beck, architect, and we were looking at it and thinking, he's saying, that's at least $2 million in build out for a two month installation. Why would Illy spend $2 million to open a store for two months? in Soho. Anybody have any ideas? I'll repeat it so that it'll, it'll show up in the podcast. Any ideas why they would spend $2 million? Carl? Uh, so people would know what it was. So people would know what it was. OK. So if I'm Illy and I'm launching, what, the, what they were doing is they were launching their coffee makers into the consumer space. They're very well established in the coffee shops. A lot of coffee shops use it for espresso and all those kinds of things. But they want to launch into the consumer space. They have some choices. The traditional way is to buy several million dollars worth of media. I can buy lots of ads. I can buy television. I can buy this. I can buy that. And how much is it going to get me? How much are people listening 
and paying attention to these ads if I'm trying to interrupt them, right? 1%, 2%. Yeah, 1%, 2%, very, very low. Uh, again, people are turning away from ads, right? People are not, they're just not as effective. Maybe they've never been effective, you know what I mean? But especially in this day and age, they're not very effective. So if I spend $5 million in advertising, I may not get as much as I get from this $2 million in creating a pop-up retail store. So what happens is that I create this store and it's so audacious to create a store and spend that much money on it that the media then wants to talk about it. Does that make sense? So you get lots of free media which is more credible than paid media. And people come and they start spreading word of mouth. People who are coffee aficionados uh, who are traveling in kind of a hot place where there's a lot of tourists, a lot of people coming through doing business, they tell each other saying, man, you've got to go to this place. You can have some coffee, sit down, there's really beautiful art, you can watch some films. You know what I mean? The experience is such that people want to tell their friends and then people come to. So it becomes a, 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 you know, you get more with honey than with vinegar. People want, they're attracted to it, they want to come and participate in it, and there's word of mouth. Even if you don't ever see it, you heard about it and then maybe you come across it in the media. And so you then understand what Illy is trying to do and it, it's more effective in getting uh, your awareness than, than it would be if I bought $5 million worth of media. So that $2 million in spend for this store, for them, I believe was very effective. And here's another example I just learned about yesterday from Brand Experience Lab. Um, David Polanchak is the, the, the guy there and, and they just launched for MSN uh, uh, a movie experience last, uh, last few weeks in Los Angeles. And what happened was that it's in a movie theater, so it's an ad for MSN. And uh, in the movie theater, it's a thing where it's called crowd control. They're going to be launching it at movie theaters over the next couple years, where they have a technology that reads the motion of the crowd. And it's kind of like a pong game where things fall from the screen and the crowd has to lean left or right together to move the, the little paddle, <laughs> right? And so as they move the paddle back and forth, they have to move it and work together to like keep the ball in the air or the baby from falling or whatever it might be, you know what I mean? And so um, they did research afterward and the highest recorded retention rate for an advertising message was in like the 50% range. They got 70 some percent unaided recall of the brand message from this experience. You know what I mean? So these are the kind of things that we're talking about. Um, this is Lint Chocolate in the Zurich airport. They have like a chocolate theater kind of thing. So they're making chocolate right there. So if you're walking down the, the airport um, and you have a little time, you're going to go in and watch this theater of them making chocolate and they have a display of chocolate airports and they have samples for you and this woman dressed in a traditional Swiss outfit, you know, and then you end up walking out with chocolate. This is um, in London in the Covent Garden area. I was walking in there and saw this little pod in a small eyeglasses shop. Very, very small shop. Narrow street, lots of, lots of foot traffic. So how do you get people in off the street? This drew me in right away. I saw this and I'm like, I've got to, I've got to see this. It's a little pod that you sit inside. It's got a wireless keyboard and mouse. It's got speakers and music. And what you can do is you, you try on the glasses. It takes photographs of you and then um, you can put on your real glasses to see what you look like because if you're trying on frames, they don't have your lenses, right? How do you see what you look like? So, so you try on your glasses, it takes photographs and then you can come back and see what the frames look like, 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 like up here. Um, this was, I, I, Carl and I saw this in uh, the Burton demo tour in Park City when Carl was at a ski race this winter. So Burton, in doing a, a tour, they wanted to do this program, but instead of just doing it themselves, they got all these partners to come with them. So they have Motorola, Volvo, Wii, Snickers, Paul Mitchell, uh, Red, and uh, you've also got the Burton things. And so basically they brought these kind of igloo-shaped things and, and they did this tour of all the ski resorts in the western United States. It was so much fun. Here it is kind of from the far away, what attracts you to go see it, and close up. They have uh, the Volvo, they had this game. So if you sign up and give them your name and number, you're 18 years old, and you give them your address so they can do marketing messages to you, they give you, they like spin the wheel and whatever it lands on, they give you. So um, we got a little video game. Um, and other people got socks, other people got a chance to win a car. Um, this was a really cool thing and it was really fun and I was totally willing to give them my information to participate in this. However, they didn't follow up very well. The letter that came was just totally a generic sales letter. I had had an experience with them. 
if they were really thinking it through all the way through, they would have known that they got my information from this specific event and that I had these experiences and they could have sent me something very specific. Thank you. We're so glad to see you in Park City. Uh, you know, I hope you had some fun. Here's some other fun things. and Maybe there's some fun fold-out things, something else that kind of follows up on the experience that I had here that helps me to continue that experience. Instead, it was just a very flat sales letter. Okay, I gave them my information. I got a sales letter. You know what I mean? They could have continued to engage me. They could have given me additional incentives to go and take a test drive or something like that. Um, there, here's Carl in the, in, this, in, in the gray there playing the Wii. And then we have like, uh, they showed how the Burton is doing with technology. So they have the Burton jacket that has the cell phone inside. They have the helmets with, with the cell phone and like iPod connections. They have, so they have the Motorola. They're doing like jumps onto the uh, beanbag things with a little, this guy was amazing doing flips just out of, just off the ski resort. Um, you know, so basically it's an interactive, it's kind of like a f carnival um, that you get to go and you interact with the products. Try on the jackets, try on the, the snowboards, go take it out and, and, and slide with it, you know. Um, uh, try out, the, see how the helmets work. You get to interact with things in such a fun way that it was something that attracted people rather than trying to interrupt them. You know what I mean? It gave something back. The customer's needs here are equal to the company's needs to do promotion, right? I recognize that if you're a customer, I want to make this fun for you. I want to give something back to you. I want to make it worth your while to come so you go away thinking, that was fun. Instead of, oh, there, there they are again, another ad in front of me. So this is a piece we're working on um, that's an interactive kiosk for uh, it's time to go. Uh, so uh, the time's just about up, so I'm just going to go quickly. It's an interactive kiosk where you take a survey before the event. When you arrive at the event, your name badge has an RFID. You go up to the screen and it recognizes you by name. And, and the design is totally custom for each person who steps up. So, and at the end, we give you a variable data printed card that the design is customized based on your survey. And your name is in there. And it also gives you thank you cards asking you to continue the gratitude and then gives you a gift that you also were able to select as part of the survey. So we're actually doing this um, for a client right now. Um, there are a couple of interactive things, uh, some diagrams that show about how advertising traditionally is just about awareness. You have to take people through awareness, interest, desire, commitment, and action. Um, this is about uh, another model behind marketing about high risk versus low risk and involvement and the different things that you have to do. Um, that relate to whether it's a high risk purchase or a low risk purchase. Creative services is right up there. <laughs> and uh, in the global context. So I've got some more things that have to do about that, but I'm out of time. So uh, thank you very much. We'll uh, end it there. Appreciate your time. Any questions? I mean, sure. if we have, people have to leave for class, feel free to, but there might be a few questions we have before we take a break. Yes. Now we need the microphone now. In the example that you used where they didn't follow through properly, yes. would you ever take the initiative to contact them and say, I happen to be in this business, um, I well, would like to give you input on, on what you did? Um, okay, hopefully, and you know, you maybe I'll do? blog about it and they'll read about it and contact me. <laughs> uh, no, that's not the way that you sell my kind of, if I'm calling them, my credibility is really low. So, uh, no. <laughs> it's not my like calling them, but just like giving them feedback that I had this experience, loved it, but your follow through. No, I, I, I used to do that. I've not, just not found it's effective. So, no, I don't do that. Yes. What's the value of, Wait. Uh, what's the value of word of mouth? Um, Monet branding, yeah. Monetized value? Yeah, what's the value, especially with today's uh, technology in terms of blogging? Because that's changing things, isn't it? It is, absolutely. Um, I'm, I don't have numbers off the top of my head as to what the monetary value of uh, word of mouth is compared to paid media, for example. But I think that people are recognizing, there's an association called the Word of Mouth Marketing Association. So they might be kind of putting out that kind of information, doing some estimates. Um, for me, it's about credibility. It's about the quality of the contact. 
It's about um, the difference between you see an ad in a magazine that you flip right by, and um, my, my cell phone must be going off over there by the microphone. <laughs> it's, um, it's about, I think it's, it's much greater value because what, what I'm concerned about is one thing is the lifetime value of the customer. I'm also interested in the, um, the quality of the contact. I'm interested in the, the long-term relationship with that customer. Does that make sense? And I feel like word of mouth has so much more credibility than any advertising that I could buy. Does that make sense? So I'm, really, I, I, I'm not discounting that you don't need other kind of advertising still, but I think that, uh, that the value is very high. With the Illy example, um, I always wonder when you have something that's just thrown out there and you get advertising that's not direct advertising, that's just the press picking up something, which was intentional, it looked like in this case, right? Yep. Um, does the company or a company like that have a marketing plan? They, they have individuals that go out and try and hit up the press to say, hey, you know, have you guys yeah. seen this and how you know, weird it is or whatever it may be so they can get that you know, negative slash positive advertising? Absolutely. That, when, when you're preparing to do something like this, you would absolutely have your PR team on. So let, let's compare the old way versus the new way. Old way, you hire your advertising team and the media planners that say, okay, we're going to buy in all these places, television, magazine, billboards, et cetera, and we're going to spend our money this way. This way, it's basically you've got your architects, your creatives and creating the experience, and then your PR team to help tell the story. So absolutely, there are press releases, there are follow-ups, there are, there's a lot of energy that goes into developing free media. I mean, it's not easily won. If you're, if you're really brilliant and you do something that's absolutely amazing, you can get away with not having a PR team. Otherwise, it's just that PR that you see happening is likely driven by a PR professional making a call, doing follow-ups, providing further information. Here are some photos. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Anytime you see an article, eight or nine times out of ten, it's driven by a PR firm in the background. Absolutely. So it's a different spend. You know what I mean? Any other questions? That's it. Thanks very much. <laughs>